for next year, hopefully we'll be fully in person. I know we're going to be 75% um, in person, but um, we're, we're going to need someone to um, plan um, all the, all those types of events of like um, a hayride, for example, or, um, or, or any type of event that's other, other than our meetings, um, who's going to direct all those events. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please let me know or Justin or Jake. And with that, I'll pass it on to Justin. Awesome. Thanks so much, Vincent. Tons of great opportunities. We, um, we, we really elevated here this year at WMA, and we've got a lot of great seniors. Um, I know we've got a lot of awesome guys who are going to be taking our places. So plenty of room, guys. I encourage everyone to apply. So before I kick it over to you, Varun, I'm just going to do a quick spotlight. Um, this week, it's not an editorial. I'm actually going to be spotlighting Nate. So Nate Jefferson is a member of our news team who writes in, a, um, writes in our weekly newsletter and also is on our podcast, focuses on personal finance, some awesome articles out there. And this week, he wrote about investing with tax benefits. So if you guys want to find out what that's all about, definitely go check that out. With that, uh, Varun, I will kick it over to you. Thank you. So I came across what seemed to be a pretty low key story last week. Uh, last Thursday, it was announced that Apple was suing a former employee um, who was releasing some trade secrets from inside. Um, and this was pretty big news because Apple is a company that's very, very known for uh, the secrecy that they operate with within their company. Uh, they have a system known as disclosure where teams working on a project, they only know about the part of that project that they're working on the rest of the project, whatever that size. Uh, they don't even know what the pieces that are all going to be going together. Um, and all of that is just to prevent leaks. Uh, and according to this lawsuit, um, the employee that they're suing reached to a, reached out to a, a reporter as far back as 2018, attempting to make deals that would generate revenue for other companies that he was affiliated with. Uh, and Apple claimed that they're going to take this very seriously and they're embodying that by uh, following this lawsuit. Um, the extent to which Apple's going after this, it's a warranted, it's a warranted issue as Apple continues to try and stay at the top of a very competitive tech industry. Uh, now I'll pass it off to Andrew. Thanks. So since the since March of 2020, we saw a lot of success stories involving the market as a whole. However, compared to the S and P 500, uh, their 18% gain. 60% of large cap stock picking funds in the US underperformed. So this is actually the 11th year in a row that stock pickers ended up doing worse in the market. And you might question how this is possible seeing as almost everything was rebounding since March of last year. And a lot of these S&P 500 gains came from large tech companies. So Amazon and Apple specifically, they're up 76% and 81% respectively since last year. And these two companies make up more than 10% of the S&P. And most stock pickers don't really have the means to buy enough of these companies to make that big of an impact. And so in general, different funds had a wide array of returns. Uh, American funds, they have a fund called Growth Fund of America, and that fund returned 38%, which outperformed the S&P by more than double. And active managers dealing with mid cap stocks had an average return of 51%. And those involved in small cap were closer to 46%. And some believe that these gains are easier to come by on these smaller stocks as they aren't analyzed as thoroughly as these big name companies. And the biggest winners from last year were large cap growth funds who were up 62% and large cap value funds who ended the year with 67% gains. So by the end of 2019, $6.6 .6 trillion was being actively managed while only 4.4 trillion was being passively managed within the index. And so, we should look to see how this allocation changes after a lot of active managers failed to beat the market in a year that had a lot of opportunities. And if you want to hear more about active versus uh, passive managed funds, be sure to check out the podcast because we touch on that. And um, with that, I'll pass it to Nick. Thanks, Andrew. So this week, I decided to write about how pandemic stocks uh, last year outperformed the market in 2020. And the ultimate question here is, will they continue to outperform the market in 2021? So we all know last year, the market took a big dip and lost a tremendous amount of value. <clears throat> Airline companies, like oil companies, uh, they were hard hit and still have not fully recovered. 
but the stay at home technology stocks like Fang, for example, uh, boomed and they outperformed the market largely. Uh, Fang had an outstanding 2020 with all their stocks outperforming the S&P 500 by at least 15%. Uh, these companies greatly benefited from the lockdown since everyone was staying inside and we were all in quarantine. Uh, these stocks were thriving. Um, yeah, with everything being shut down, it makes sense to why these technology stocks reacted the way they did. As stated earlier, the big question is, will these big pandemic stocks continue to outperform the people and business as continue to outperform as people and businesses, uh, you know, start to lift and restrictions are lifted. So with that, I'll pass it over to Justin. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. I can't believe it's the 20th issue of the Spartan Journal. It's pretty crazy for me to believe. So before I officially hand it off to Professor Schistel, we've actually got a quick little intro video we want to show you guys. So um, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to get it started here. What I will ask is if you guys can't hear my sound, please let me know and um, we'll try and fix it. <laughs> Uh, my name is Hannah Hewen. I graduated in May of 2019, and I am a financial advisor at Plant Marie. I'm Garner. I'm a finance major. I graduate class of 2021 this May. After graduation, I'll be joining Raymond James Financial, doing a rotation through their uh, Associated Financial Sarah Development Wolfile. Department. I am graduate class of 2019. I am now working for Vanguard in their Scottsdale, Arizona office. Uh, as part of their financial advisor development the CFP program. classes because I'm personally driven in uh, helping people in the wealth management career space seemed like a great way to combine my desire to help others, um, I believe, my knack for understanding uh, financial markets. Somebody in one of my business classes kind of told me about the wealth management program and how it was up and coming and connected we, me with uh, Professor Schiestel. Came in as a nursing major and then I was like, this isn't for me quite, and then dove into the business school and then somehow got connected with Professor Schiestel. And just the way he like beamed about like serving clients and like just the experiences he had made me like kind of want to give it a try. Once I started taking the classes and like really realizing what wealth management was, I was like, this is for me. And I found interest in it. And it's like, you find, when you find interest in what you're doing, it doesn't feel necessarily like homework or classwork. So just kept taking the classes. Classes within the program were really a great talking that. point. Not only did they help me get through some of the case study portions, but they also allowed me to just discuss the industry and, and um, show a certain level of knowledge. Um, it was also great because employers were able to see that I was getting the educational portion of the CFP um, and getting that out of the way before actually joining a firm. They didn't have to worry about getting that part, getting me caught up to speed. Um, so overall, it just helped me move my resume up and helped me take my conversations further. The segment of financial services that did best through the financial crisis. Um, I know a lot of you are too young to really remember what that was like. But if you look, trading, blow up. Investment banking, blow up. Like every single segment of Wall Street was an outright debacle requiring massive bailouts from the government. Financial planners were the people who saved America. I would 100% recommend, um, even if you aren't sure what you want to do, if you kind of know you like finance, taking the intro classes, the intro to wealth management gives you an idea. Um, Definitely to um, my finance students, but anybody who's looking for a purpose within the business college, resources are built in a perfect way to help you succeed. Uh, I think the first mover advantage from being a part of something that's still at the ground floor, still in its infancy, um, and overall it's just a great opportunity, even to those in a social science capacity who care about the people side and want to learn the, the money side. It's just a great opportunity overall. 100% would recommend the program. There is such a need for financial advisors, for CFPs even. Such a shortage, there's such high demand. And this program, you know, having, being set up to meet the education requirements to sit for the CFP exam, it opens so many doors that otherwise you wouldn't, it's a hard barrier of entry at some points. And then also it provides such a broad network of, you know, firms within the Michigan area and then throughout the country. I'm out in Arizona, so 
I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> I would say to any Spartan, especially a freshman, um, this is your experience. Make it yours. No matter what you do, own it and be about it. Uh, take every step you can. Take advantage of every resource. Leave no stone unturned and be able to leave here saying that I would do it all again. All right. Well, without further ado, great, great program, great professor. Professor Schiefel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Oscar, um, you're, you're on. So thanks for helping out on the video and some of the great insights. And then Hannah and Claire from a few years ago. Um, that was good. Boy, when Josh Brown talks about how financial planners saved the America, you kind of get goosebumps with that. So that's an um, awesome video. So let me just share my screen and pull up. I should have already done this. Oh, let's see a 457. There we go. Okay. So again, my name is Steve Schiesto. I'm fortunate to be the director for our financial planning wealth management program here at Michigan State. So we are um, soon will be graduating year class number three. Um, we've had some super successful um, increases in the in the program, and we'll share that as I go through here. Please just fire questions. I mean, really my intent for being here today um, is just introduce what the program is all about, why someone would wanna think about this. I think the video does such a great job hearing from you know, three young people who are either in the industry or in Oscar's case, who spent a um, summer in an externship and then will be starting at um, Raymond James, um, just kind of hearing why they kind of went into that path. Uh, but again, I'll talk about the program. Anyone has any questions, fire in. Um, and then I'll try to make this as interactive as possible as we can via Zoom. Um, one thing before kind of getting started, and, and I, I think both um, you know, Vincent and Jake talked about it as far as new opportunities. One of the cool things about what the Wealth Management Association really made huge tractions on in 20 and then 2021 was the podcast, the Spartan Journal, this um, Spartan Journal podcast, because it gives more and more students more and more of you an opportunity to interact and to create. And as advisors are looking, as firms are looking for young people to come into their firms, the ability to write, communicate um, is very, very important. And so there's a big difference between writing a paper for class for a professor and writing a paper for consumption for the everyday real world. And I think this just gives you an exercise in going through it. So um, again, you know, definitely get involved, whether your thing is writing or your thing is maybe talking. I think that, you know, the, the infrastructure that's being built is just going to provide you huge opportunities. And obviously, if you're sitting across from someone talking about why you want to get in the industry and what you have um, to provide, content creation, marketing type stuff is, is huge in the industry. Okay, so that being said, let me just get in here. And again, don't hesitate to just fire a question as, as we go through this. Um, so what is wealth management? One of the things like, so again, our program is financial planning and wealth management. And the, 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 the planning piece and then the wealth piece kind of go hand in hand. And there's many definitions of this. The best one I like is from a consultant to the industry is helping people make smart decisions with their money, okay? That's what we do in this industry. We help people make smart decisions with their money, whether it's our own, if we're just learning about this to help us make smart decisions, but again, um, those that are going to go through all the classes and the coursework, this is going to be a career. And so we're going to try to help all different types of people, you know, all parts of the industry, location wise, you name it, but to try to help them um, to make the best possible decisions to achieve their goals and their objectives that they have. And so again, many definitions of thinking about it. One way to think about planning. So the planning idea, it is not so much the plan, okay, the document, the, I think it was Carl Richards in the podcast that dropped last week where I, I, I'm just paraphrased, but it's almost like the minute that the quote unquote plan is finished, it's worthless. I don't know if it's exactly that was his word, but I think the point is this is an evolving process because our lives evolve. And there's really a, many different aspects to planning. If you look back through the history of this industry, everything kind of started back in the day with investments, okay? And oftentimes you can tell a old school stockbroker versus a true wealth manager financial planner if all they do is talk about the investments. 
Okay, so there's a wide assortment of things that we talk about within this discipline, within this industry, where we start about cash flow. Okay, and there might simply be a situation where someone's financial issues might be that they spend too much money, or that maybe they don't earn enough money. And it's almost a quote unquote career counseling, like you have to invest in yourself. And that's what, as young people, you're doing that, right? You're going to undergrad, you may go get an accreditation or some type of designation, you're making an investment in your human capital. But it's cash flow management. It might be debt management, like, hey, you're just carrying on too much credit card debt, or you know, the student loan issue has to get resolved in a very, very um, proactive uh, manner. It might be education planning, which for either parents or grandparents might be thinking about how do I help take care of the children? It might be, a, as we go around the spoke here, it might be insurance planning, which is risk management. I mean, we can have the best plan in the world. I can lay out a plan to help someone achieve their goals, always update it, but there are things that can happen that can derail it, right? You can lose a job, you can become disabled. Um, God forbid one of the, if it's a, if it's a, a family situation um, with two parents, one parent, you know, passes away, what impact does that have on the family? So we, gotta, we have to risk mitigate that through insurance and other means. Retirement planning, which is usually the number one goal that the majority of Americans have. How do we plan for that appropriately? We talk about investments, estate planning. How do I, how do I hand assets off to the next generation or through charitable inclination? How do I do that in the most constructive and, and, and efficient way possible? And then tax planning. All of these issues weave and intersect themselves and it makes for a very fascinating um, opportunity because no two people, no two clients are the same and no two situations are the same. And so it allows us to use these dis different disciplines to help make the most effective planning engagement with each and every client that we have. Okay, so me, coming down here, I think Claire talked about the need for advisors. There is a huge need for advisors, okay? Um, in addition to these wealth management classes, I also have the privilege of teaching Finance 457, which is a security analysis class where we try to be stock pickers, okay? And some students will say, I want to go into the asset management business. Well, the dynamics in asset management is that unless you're in the hedge fund space, this is becoming an industry that fee compression is making it hard to find jobs. That is the complete opposite in advisories, um, in the advisory capacity. And there's a huge need. So I can't remember if the, the exact number, but let's say there's about 300,000 advisors in the United States. Okay, so these are advisors who try to take care of 350 million people. And so oftentimes I think even... Um, one of the podcast guests, I think Michael Kitsis might have even talked about, if we take the number of people in the United States, each, each advisor can handle 100, the numbers work out where we still have need for more advisors. So one thing is that people are living longer, okay? Or excuse me, the first one is that we know that majority of Americans really are not ready for probably the most important um, event that's gonna occur is when they stop working, okay? The old world where you would work to 65, start drawing on social security, and by 68, the life expectancy would say that the majority of people would pass away. The ability to save and have that need wasn't as great as it is today, okay? So people are just not ready for this event. So the need for the average person all across the socioeconomic um, scale, um, there's a need to have someone guide them, advise them to prepare for the super important event. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is that people are living longer. Okay, so not only are they prepared for retirement in today's world, but as people live longer, there's going to be more, there's going to be additional needs, requirements, tools that we're going to need to deploy in order to help people bridge these gaps and make good, solid advice. Okay, so again, trying to make the decision between Tesla, Amazon, um, Apple, I mean, those stocks, I mean, that, that can be fun and things to talk about, but that's not going to help people reach a particular goal when we think over a time frame of, you know, 20, 30, 40 years in retirement. And then the last thing, which I think is applicable for all of you on, the, on this call would be is like, when I go through this whole exercise called college, right? And we get back face to face, we get to have fun in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, but at the end of the experience, the idea is, is that you can walk away with a job, okay? And a good paying job and a, satisfy, a satisfying job. So when we look at the current industry dynamics, that if we use the number 300,000 advisors in the United States, that anywhere from 25 to 30% of those advisors today are within 10 years of retirement, okay? The statistics still bear out that the CFP designation, okay, the, the um, credential of choice within this space, there are more advisors 
who have the CFP over the age of 70 than under the age of 30. Okay, so it is definitely in an older profession. There's a whole host of reasons that that occurred, but it is amazing the number of firms that are waking up to the realization that says, oh wow, every single person in my firm is over 50. What are we gonna do for the future? And so the light bulbs are going on for firms really across the spectrum, which again is gonna open up opportunities for all of you. And this is happening almost day by day as firms that have kind of ignored this are starting to pop in saying, we just realized we have, an, we have a problem and we gotta start fixing it. Can you help us? So that's awesome, okay? That's awesome that you can really then pick and choose what kind of firm works and is kind of applicable or maybe fits best with what it is you want to do. And we, we touch on all that when we get in the program. So that's kind of like the need for advisors. Um, a cool thing is that, again, you may not want, not necessarily want to be a front facing advisor. Okay, that's cool. That's where a lot of the need is, but there's still um, um, opportunities. I was talking to an advisor down in Arkansas, the second one being a, just a financial planner only where you're building plans. And he runs something called, he has a paraplanner firm where he is gonna be bringing on young people into his firm and their clients are other advisors. And they're actually doing the hardcore coding inside of financial planning software so that the front facing advisor doesn't necessarily do that, but yet you can still be involved in the process. CIO is the investment operations of firms, operations, compliance, one thing that I should have put in here was marketing. Um, Justin and I was just talking about one of the firms reaching out saying, hey, wow, you know what? If, um, if someone has a lot of the content marketing stuff that the WMA is doing, that could even be a fit. So we're seeing more firms even adding those types of specialties uh, within their firms, all large and small. So lots of different opportunities. Uh, let me stop there and just talk about and see if anyone has any burning questions before I kind of jump into what we're doing here at Michigan State or in with Embroad. Okay, so um, our program. Um, the first thing is that our program is registered with the CFP. So what does that mean? Prior to 2019, if a Spartan um, was gonna go, and I'm just gonna use Plant Moran as an example because they were one, they were the main catalyst to where we are today. If a student walked across the stage with their diploma, went to work for Plant Moran, the first thing Plant Moran said is, hey, congratulations, welcome to the firm. Real world starting here, you gotta go back to school. And then they would send people to the College of Financial Planning where they would have to take online classes, um, six classes, and then study and sit for the exam. The advantages for everyone in the program is that they're doing that, the students are doing that inside of their undergrad. So that when they walk again across the stage, and hopefully this year, whether it's a stage or across the parking lot somewhere, right? But still, you're going to get that um, you're going to get that diploma that all of the education component is done, and then you can then sit for the exam. So I mentioned here the four E's. So in order to be a CFP, you need four things. And the CFP again stands for Certified Financial Planner. So a CFP designate, you need four things. One, you need education, an education component. That's where we come in. Okay, completing the, all of the classes as prescribed in the program. Number two, that you abide by ethical standards. And they're pretty strict standards, which basically means we will treat all of our clients in their best interest, okay? We will treat them like we would treat our own parents' money, okay? And we're not gonna, we'll disclose all conflicts of interest and that we will be forthright in how we make decisions, okay? Unfortunately, you would think that, that would be common sense for every single advisor anywhere in the country. Unfortunately, that's not the case. But being a true fiduciary is the second component of that. Um, the third E would be the exam, the actual exam that you would take post-graduation. And then the fourth E would be is once you acquire the necessary experience, which is generally three years, then you can throw the credentials behind your name. But as Michael Kitsis mentioned in his podcast um, a couple of weeks ago, is that just getting to the exam is a differentiator for you. Okay, passing the exam would tell, you. let's say if I pass the exam and I'm still looking for the right job, that's gonna tell a lot of companies that you got the hard part done, right? The last thing then before you have that CFP credential behind your, or, or that um, designation behind your name is all you gotta do is wait for time for experience to get it um, for you, okay? And so again, really awesome thing that we're able to do that. The other thing within the program is the experiential opportunities. WMA, all the cool things that WMA is doing. One of the things Justin and I had planned 
before this pandemic came along with trying to do road shows. I mean, we have so many super cool firms all throughout the state, even clustered down in Southeast Michigan. Um, you know, we were gonna try to do things like that. Obviously this year it's been a little bit different, but everything within WMA, um, industry conferences, again, pre and post um, pandemic, we can get back um, out into conferences, um, career services through internships, full-time opportunities, even in the externship that W or that the, FC, that the um, FPA put on last year. Awesome opportunity. I know that Oscar has talked about the, um, the um, externship in the past and then just mentorships. One of the things that I really want, and I know that within WMA, there's a mentorship program between um, under between you know um, freshmen and sophomores and juniors and seniors. One thing I really want to do next year is that there are so many Spartans in the industry that want to give back. And they want to reach back out to students and saying, hey, can I like mentor you, help you out? And so I think that'll be a nice addition um, next year. Um, within classes, and that's really why, why I'm talking to you now is everyone is thinking about classes. So one of the things that, um, well, let me just first talk about the classes and then what that means for depending on if you're a sophomore or if you're, or excuse me, if you're a rising junior or if you're a rising senior, okay? So in order to, in order to have the education component completed in whole, you need to complete these six classes. Okay, so if you're in Broad, everyone takes 311, check. If you're in Broad and you're a finance major, all finance majors take finance 312, okay? And then there are these four remaining classes which are unique to the program, which is the intro 370, insurance risk management, finance 380, uh, finance 460 for income tax and estate planning, and then finally the wrap up capstone class in the spring of your senior year, which is finance 470. So six classes in total. Uh, one item though of note is that if you are a rising junior, okay, I would strongly recommend that all rising juniors in the fall take finance 370. A, you'll be introduced to the topics that we talk about, to how the industry is structured and laying the foundation of what a good financial planner is gonna do. And it'll allow you to pick up more of the vernacular on top of all the other things that you're doing so that it'll position you um, hopefully to do as well as possible when it comes time for internship conversations. Um, and then you can pick up either um, you know, in that same fall, if you choose to, you know, maybe a 380 class and then pick up the other classes as seniors. If you are a rising senior, then you're obviously are going to need to take 370, 380, and 460 in the fall, and then the 470 class in the spring. One of the things that is, is occurring that will occur probably in the next six weeks by what I've been told May 1st is that we will have a minor. Okay, there will be a minor in financial planning wealth management. And as part of that process, the classes 370, 380, 460, and 470 are all getting tucked into the minor, okay? So if you are a freshman or a sophomore, um, then in that case, as you're thinking into the future, you can think, hey, I'll just clear this as my minor, take these four remaining classes that are down in the bottom, bang, knock it out, take my finance electives and graduate and life is good. Uh, for those that are rising seniors, um, again, as the minor kicks in, one of the things that I worked out with UAS and the department chair is to kind of flex around. If someone's schedule is super, super tight, that taking the minor plus all the other classes are going to be a problem, just let me know. Okay. And we can, we know that as for all of those that are rising seniors, some may have issues, some may work perfect, life is good, uh, but we just want to be accommodating to as many students as possible so that this will work for you. And what do I have here? Okay, so stay involved. WMA, again, great, great student group. Um, I think that the, the amount of learning that occurs within the group is amazing. Listen to the podcast. Again, I am, I am so incredibly shocked of about the, the quality of guests, not only alums, but industry thought leaders. There's an there's a, um, investor trying to think of what the group is. There's a group out there that will rank the top 10 most influential RIAs. And I think it's either five or six of the top 10 have been on the WMA podcast, okay? So we're talking like true industry thought leaders. I mean, Michael Kitsis, who demands $20,000 speaking engagements in any conference he goes to, gave an hour of his time to us as Spartans. So that was awesome. Um, Again, consider this as a career. Think about if it's a good fit. Um, review your you know, schedule with the classes and then again, the minor is coming. 
Um, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop talking, is that when you think about this as a career, and I always give this analogy, is that if you want to, if, if you are looking for a profession where you work with people, right, where you can sit across the desk or sit next to someone on a couch and listen to someone, empathize with their situation, and come up with a strategy for them to, to try to achieve their goals or resolve an issue that they might be facing and do it in a financial means, this is the career for you, okay? And it doesn't mean that the other areas in finance um, are not as worthy of your talents. I think the key thing is just to know where is, where is your personality and where does your, I guess, you know, passion resides where maybe you can find the best fit possible. Um, I always give the, the story that when I was at the bank, uh, one of the third party analysts that we use for getting stock research was CFA, super smart guy, knew transportation companies inside and out, what was the biggest grouch in the world. I mean, we would be like, who's calling Bob? And it'd be like, oh, it's your turn. And he'd get on the phone and he'd be 90% of the time would be grouchy and would kind of make it sound like you're an idiot while you're asking the question. And then one day I got him, he was a kind of, he must've had a really, he must've had a couple couple of cups of coffee and was in a good mood. And he goes, something like, you probably wonder why I'm always grouchy. I'm like, no, I never really paid attention. He goes, listen, all I want to do is sit in my office, door closed, read my 10 Ks and build my models. If I didn't have to talk to anyone, life would be good. And I'd be like, wow, I never really, I never really pictured that. It'd be like, yeah, no kidding, dude. So Bob would have been a terrible advisor, okay? And there's nothing wrong, but we need the world of Bob's to analyze stocks and do all that. But, but again, if you think through, you know, whether listen to podcasts, being involved, um, even listening to the little video that we're going to have go out there live, I think that really tells the whole story of what it is like to be a, a financial advisor. So I'll stop there. Hit me with some questions. What's on everyone's mind? Uh, Professor, I actually have a quick question. Um, I'm planning on taking finance. Um, it was a securities analysis class. Um, I think that's finance 457. That's yeah, correct. 457, and it says that on the portal, I need permission to take that class. Is that permission from you or is that from somebody else? That is from me. Just send me an email and you can even kind of jump ahead. Normally in that email, I'll come back saying, hey, can you tell me how security analysis fits with your career goals? Um, and then just I'm trying to think, what else do I ask? Usually ask that and then just tell me a couple interesting finance books you've read, not textbooks, right? You know, how many of you have read a textbook that you're like, is really fascinating? Yeah, see, exactly my point. <laughs> yep, send that Thank my you. way and then we can, we, we can find a space. But generally right now, so there's a section in the fall and there's two sections in the spring. So just check out the new system and see which one works. Perfect. And what else is on, or I can even look in the chat. If you have a question, you can throw it in the chat here as well. Let me see, I don't see anything yet. Professor, maybe I'll just say something real quick. So I, as somebody who was a junior who took the class, it was outstanding. Like I can't recommend it enough. As just like, I, was, I didn't have much experience as a sophomore. Um, I took the class the fall semester of my junior year while I was in the class as a junior, I was interviewing in, at places and it really helped me get my internship. Not only that, I went to a really cool industry conference um, all the way in San Diego, California, that that would have never happened if I wasn't a junior in the class. So just wanted to echo that. Um, my experience can't echo it, you know, can't say it enough. Definitely take 370 in the fall. And then what I would say, and I, kind of then following on that is that there have been, in, you know, literally, you know, less than a handful of students, but there has been a few students that took the 370 class, wasn't quite sure, you know, let me just feel it out. And they either were like, I mean, there's been a couple that reached out going, wow, I finally found, this is what I want to do. And then others I wouldn't hear from after the class, which weren't in the program, which probably was like, okay, I'm going to pivot off, which is cool, right? That's what we, that's what college is meant for to kind of explore. But I guess having that experience sooner rather than later, obviously, can just help you decide what is the best fit for you. Hey, 
Hey guys, don't don't waste this opportunity. This is the guy right here. He's the one that's going to get you addicted to the lifestyle. So definitely, definitely <laughs> use this opportunity to talk to him. And again, I wanted to use this as a chance because I know that for some of the seniors and for I, I've, I've already spoken to a, a couple of rising seniors that with this change to the minor isn't going to cause problems, you know, meaning that, OK, I got to pivot a few things and maybe instead of taking world of turf, I'll take a finance elective to make it fit perfect, you know. Uh, but again, I just wanted to I just really wanted to make sure a that everyone kind of can see the maybe the sequencing of classes in order to get everything completed. And then again, if you're a, a rising senior, how to make sure like, okay, if, if you run into a, a roadblock or if you're getting, getting conversation or having conversations with advisors that seem to conflict, just reach out to me because I want to make sure everyone gets in the right place um, with, some of the, with some of the adjustments that are going on. So questions about classes, questions about the industry, you know, Yeah, uh, I'm a freshman right now. So when will I get the opportunity to take some of those classes? Yeah, so um, I would say probably that, you know, because probably 311 would be the first finance class that you would take. So whether you take that um, next year as a sophomore, whether it's in the fall or in the spring, uh, by the time you get to your junior year is where you could take the finance 312 class, the intro to investments, and then the 370 class, the intro to wealth management. That'd probably be your, that would put you on a, perfect um, perfect cadence in order, in order to get everything finished. All right, thank you. Junior year is a great year to start for sure because I had to take this entire concentration within my senior year and I also had my um, credits I had to finish out with. So I think I had eight classes last semester and I have five this semester. So, um, you know, getting a head start on it for those who, first off, it's possible to do um, but getting a head start on it as a freshman, sophomore, and kind of figuring out this is something you want to do is definitely a great, great idea because um, it's possible, but it is, you know, six classes, so. So, Professor, you said just by doing the program and being eligible for the CFP after these six classes, you're going to be completing the minor as well. Perfect. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. And so I also new with the new add-on, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I also want to echo Oscar kind of because I joined the program in the middle of my fall junior year, and I'm going to be a, I'm a rising senior now, and I'm going to have to cram those for in next year. I'm going to be doing 370, 380, and 460 in the fall. And then I'm going to do the capstone in the spring. So if you're thinking about this and kind of unsure, I really recommend taking 370 in the fall because from what I've heard, there's been a lot of great experiences in that class and you can kind of get a feel for the industry. Yeah, and, and I think that that's where WMA is just going to be so helpful because if I'm a freshman and I, you know, stumble into the student group, I'm a sophomore and I start, you know, I, I think that's where the podcasts are so cool and the Spartan Journal and you can just kind of like observe and, and, and listen to, you know, people talk about careers and if it looks like it fits, bang, you know, you're, you're ready to go. But yeah, you know. If someone has to take it, and really the way our very first year in 2019, every single senior, they were they were the program. <laughs> so they took all, all four of the, um, uh, of the specialized classes as seniors as well. But, but now this year with the, the fact that it will be declared a minor opens up the obligation to take other electives. And that's why I just wanted to make sure that again, if, um, I think like Justin would have been and Oscar would have been a case where they could, they could I wouldn't even, they weren't even double counting because there was not a minor. There's not a minor today. So they were able to use those as electives, finance electives, and it worked. And the way that's going to work in the future is that everything will be a minor, um, and that it'll push those out of being eligible electives. And so I said, hey, what do I do for my seniors that, you know, the situation changed. So I, I just want to make sure that the message is not like, oh my gosh, we're, you know, I got to find three more classes that we can, you know, if it does become an issue, we can come up with some some alternatives. 
So I want to actually put Vincent on the spot here and ask him, hey, Vincent, do you have to be a finance major to take the classes? Absolutely not. I am a marketing major. And I can tell you guys right now that you can be an accounting major, marketing major, supply chain major. Heck, you don't even need to be in the business school to, to, to be part of this program. So um, if you have a passion for finance or personal finance at all, um, do this program. I like because because what was jump started me to this program was my love for personal finance um, four or five years ago or something like that. And just that that kind of led me to the program, which led me to WMA. So um, don't let your major hold yourself back from taking these classes because these are classes that you will be using for the rest of your life. So. Yeah, what's funny is year one, uh, we had 16 students that graduated and 11 of them went into the industry. Five did not obviously go in the industry. And so one of the students in particular uh, went to work in corporate finance at Stryker and said, I'm taking these classes because I think they're gonna be beneficial for me, making my own personal decision. And actually I think with her personality, she would be an awesome advisor. And so I could see in a few years reaching back out going, Brooke, how do you like corporate finance? <laughs> you might wanna think about something, but she has that in her back pocket. So that's an awesome thing to have. And guys, I just want to add something really quickly too, is that that's what makes this program really special and what sets us apart from other programs within, within Broad is that it's available for any program in Michigan State. Um, I, I just really want to emphasize that because like there are not a lot of programs that offer that. So the flexibility that we have and that, and that other students have is really, really special. Absolutely. That, that's one of the main advantages, and that's why the dean was such a proponent of having the program fall into a minor just to give students that are maybe not embroed, but specifically wants to target this as a career, as an opportunity. Professor, you mentioned uh, a couple of books that we'd have to read for the um, 357 security analysis class. Um, so what kind of investment book security analysis um, readings would you recommend um, for us? Yeah, so specifically, I guess in, in 457, I mean, the only book that is, the, the textbook is called The Little Book of, of Value Investing by Chris Brown, like a 170 page book. Um, the rest of it is stuff that we do in class. Um, but if someone is just wanting to get a start in investments and you know, reading some of the industry classics can always be beneficial. Um, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about, you know, read Intelligent Investor. That is probably the one book that gets recommended the most, just because I think it was, you know, by, in fact, it was written by Ben Graham, you know, so anyone that has a interest in investment, um, it is, it's still applicable, even though some of the stories are a little bit dated as far as the companies, but the mindset is, is, is accurate. Um, even like some of the other classics, the random walk down Wall Street of Burt Malkiel is another one where if someone says, you know, tell me what you've been reading, you know, and that depending on the firm you're talking to, whether it's an internship or full time, I mean, the, the guy that I'm partnered um, within a within with a wealth management firm, I mean, that is one of his favorite questions. Tell me, like, what, how do you keep up with, with what's going on in the world? Tell me what your process is. You know, do you read the Wall Street Journal? What, what do you read? Tell me how you stay on top of things. And then the second thing is, Tell me the last couple of books you've read. And if the answer is I haven't, then he's on to the next person. Cause he's like, this isn't, and, and again, this pie is not as applicable, but boy, you can definitely set you up to set you apart as a student, but this would be more as, as he's talking to like ongoing professionals. Um, but just thinking, cause again, you know, I know depending on the, the course load that you have, like Oscar's course load doesn't probably give him a whole lot of available time to start cranking through some books right now. However, you know, thinking about having something at least on the uh, proverbial nightstand or whatever we whatever we call it today, um, kind of on the in the queue can always be good. Because the book that Josh Brown talked about as being a, a, a life changer for him was um, "Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth" by by Nick Murray, which is an awesome book. So again, even having a couple of titles you know, sitting there in the queue, at least would be like, yep, here's what, what I got. Here's what I'm reading um, next. Cool. Thank so I, know, you. Right? You, you, 
I, I know, Brent, you originally talked about 457, but that was kind of, I kind of took that on a little bit of a tangent too. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I, I think I remember him mentioning the simple wealth and inevitable uh, wealth uh, during the uh, student summit. So I'll check that yep. out. Just throwing this out here too. We do have a recommended book list. Sorry for interrupting, but we do have a recommended book list on our website. I'll show that in the, in the chat. So. Okay, who's next? Can I have a little bit more information about the Wealth Management Association, like, and how to join and stuff? Because this is my first uh, session, and I just, I think that'd be very interesting for me to join. Absolutely. Welcome, Cameron. Um, it's good to meet you. So this year has been a kind of experiment, so to speak. So all you got to do to join, quite frankly, is come to our 630 meetings. We waive dues this year. Everything is on Zoom. It's online. Um, I mentioned earlier, our, you came in a great time, actually, because you'll catch our last corporate speaker. We had a corporate speaker series this year, and I'm there next Tuesday. So make sure to sign up for our email list. I'll drop that in the chat as well. That's how we keep you up to date with all the events we do. Main touch points are, though, are definitely our Tuesday 6.30 meetings, and then keeping up with the podcast and the Spartan Journal, which we have been uh, continuously plugging. So that, um, that, that's the big stuff. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and again, I I know I mentioned earlier about the about the podcast, but um, you know, when someone like a Michael Kitsas um, gets on, like there's an advisor, um, there's an advisor friend who's an alum, huge huge helper to the program, and we were talking one day, and I mentioned that yeah, the students had interviewed Michael Kitsas, and he said, oh no, they didn't. I'm like yeah, they did. Wait, he goes, are you kidding me? So I was all geeked out about it, went and told my wife, and she's like, who? I'm like, how do you not know this guy's like a superstar? But I guess that's when, I guess you define superstar with whatever is your field of interest. But <laughs> so you may, you, it's not one of those names you can probably drop with, um, with, your, um, with your friends and they'll be impressed. But within our little, within our little bubble here, it's a, um, it's a pretty cool name. It's a huge accolade, I think, for what the um, WMA has been able to accomplish and achieve. Professor, no, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, so you were saying um, once you take those classes, it makes you eligible to take or sit for the CFP. Um, how exactly does that process go? Like once you graduate? Yeah. So once you graduate, so typically think about it as this: is that the education piece is separate than the actual exam piece of the process. And so you would post, let's call it post-graduation, you would start studying um, for this. You'd go into some type of a um, program or you, you'd, you'd purchase some type of a study program. And then from there you would, you know, kind of sit for the exam. So typically they recommend maybe two to 300 hours of preparation, you know, where you're taking, let's say, coursework to prepare for the exam. But again, you can do that in your space between, you know, finishing undergrad and starting a job. Or oftentimes, students want to get a little bit of um, experience, and then they'll sit for it. Okay. I know Lance, so I'm about to graduate. I'm going to be spending the whole summer studying, so to speak. So spending, splitting my mornings. I know that might night sound might not sound too exciting. But I know a lot of people who at the firm I'm starting at who have been at the firm for two or three years, they're just now sitting for the exam. So my buddy who I interned with, um, she just sat for it or she's sitting for it right now in March. And she's been with the firm since like the beginning of 2017. So I know for me, I'm going to be like, as soon as I graduate, turn my attention to studying and then I'm going to take the exam in November. So hope that helps. Yeah, and I guess one follow on that is that the CFP does encourage students to take it really within the first year and they give a pretty, um, a pretty reduced exam price in order to accomplish that because really what they want is they want students to come out of these programs and sit for the exam and complete it. Um, just so that there's not any, you know, I, again, it's like anything else, the longer you wait, the um, maybe the more comfortable you get in a non in a not study session. <laughs> And they want, really want people to be able to, they, they really want CFPs out in the industry. I mean, obviously it benefits the industry, 
but then also obviously, you know, there's there's a little bit of an incentive for the CFP because they really want more charter holders out there. So good question, Lance. Thanks. Is it just wealth management careers that you need a CFP for, or is it most finance careers as well? Um, just it's I mean, you can't really take the credential away, but generally it'd be applicable for advisory. So for example, if I was a CFP and wanted to go into corporate finance, um, they probably would wonder well, what, what that is, <laughs> you know, they'd be like, oh, that's cool. You know, so it's not, a, it's, it wouldn't be a negative. It's just that if you ported that over into some type of other non front facing financial advisory capacity, it might just be like, uh, okay, you know, <laughs> and one example of this, when I was in, when I was in um, corporate lending, I was, I was working on my CFA and everyone in my department had no idea what I was doing. Like, why, why are you doing that? But they didn't know what my ultimate plan was at that point was I was going to be the next Warren Buffett and didn't really, really work out that way, but that was my vision. So yeah, it depends on which vertical you're in and what's the kind of the useful application of that credential. All right. Thank you. You're welcome.